Welcome everyone. Welcome to our, um, our first event for the Center for Mexican Studies. My name is Gaspar Rivera Salgado. And uh, I wanna thank our co-sponsors, the Institute for Research and Labor and Employment and the Institute for Latin American Studies. Um, we want to start with a land acknowledgement. As a land grant institution, the Center for uh, Mexican Studies at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino Tomba people as the traditional land caretakers of Tomba Bar, Los Angeles Basin in Southern Channel Island. So welcome uh, to this very interesting uh, presentation by a team of um, artists, filmmakers based in Tijuana. And when I was thinking about the members of Dignicraft, I was thinking about how does the United States, how does the experience of the Latino community, the Mexican community looks from the South? What is this, the gaze from the South look like? What are the interesting issues uh, that they would look at? So it, um, it was great when we contacted the members of Dickley Craft, Paola Rodriguez, Jose Luis Figueroa and Omar Foglio and asked them to come to present uh, uh, to us, not a specific documentary. If you check their website, dignicraft.org, you can see the amazing portfolio that they have. And lately they've been collaborating with a local TV station, KCT, focusing on these historical pieces on the Latino experience um, uh, in the United States. So you can see there that they have a documentary a companion along the exhibit of La Raza, that famous newspaper from the 1960s, 1970s, that it was at the Autry Museum. So KCP contacted um, Dignity Craft to do a companion uh, uh, documentary. So that was interesting, a very specific uh, period of history. The KCP also did a piece on um, uh, the response to Prop 187 in California. And they did a wonderful job in terms of interviewing many political actors that we know. And it was very interesting to see some uh, colleagues there uh, with historian Toby Higby, we're interviewing uh, activists from the 1960s and 70s. So it was great to see Joel Ochoa, who was a political uh, refugee from the student movement in Mexico, coming to LA and becoming a uh, force to reckon with in the labor movement. And also as part of this 187 movement. So that was very interesting. Also, Dignity Craft has a new documentary uh, and they're going to present it uh, very soon in, in, in a few weeks in Installate, a self uh, graphic uh, design. And this is a documentary about the transnational life of this group of immigrants from Jalisco trying to sustain life in their communities of origin. So that is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Also, Dignity Craft has done a lot of documentaries on Tijuana. And actually, it was very interesting. We went to dinner uh, yesterday, and they were uh, sharing with us how they started with this um, underground program, uh, El Bulbo. I don't know if you remember. The, what, how, how do you translate that, El Bulbo? The um, the bulb, the, um, <laughs> it's like, okay, that's a, a piece of museum, right? It's like, okay, you know, when we did the transition to transistors, then we don't longer need uh, bulbs. And, and they did, they started doing these very uh, short capsules on life in Tijuana. So back in the 1990s, they were documenting uh, uh, live from the, uh, in Tijuana, from the perspective of multiple players, politicians, taqueros, migrants, and more recently, it's interesting that they followed that. They've been chronicling the life uh, in Tijuana because more recently they've been also engaged in documenting the experiences of the um, refugees arriving to Tijuana, right? And this started maybe 10, 12 years ago with uh, the first wave of Haitian immigrants, for example, that like were coming to, to Tijuana border. And it's kind of an issue, right? For a long time, it was just Mexican crossing the border. And all of a sudden, this mig migratory wave started diversifying and, and, and with Haitians. And now they've been 12 years of settlement. So if you walk around the streets of Tijuana, now they're also uh, working in car washes, uh, selling on the street. 
Um, but also you have, of course, the huge wave of Central Americans, uh, Africans, more recently, more recently, Ukrainians coming through Tijuana. So they've been part of documenting that uh, experience. So please help me welcome the uh, members of Dignity Craft, Paola Rodriguez, Jose Luis Figueroa, Mark Foglio. They have a wonderful presentation for us and hopefully we can engage in a conversation about the gays from the South in looking at the experience, Latino experience in California and in Tijuana. So welcome and take it away, please. Thank you very much, Gaspar, for the uh, wonderful introduction. And thank you all for being here. Thanks, everyone, who is uh, uh, joining us via Zoom. Uh, we've titled our uh, talk today, uh, By National Perspective, Tijuana and Los Angeles, through the documentary work of uh, Dignity Craft. And uh, first, I'll just briefly introduce ourselves, and then uh, I'll tell uh, talk a bit about our, our approach uh, for our talk today. Um, uh, we started working under the name Dignicraft in 2013. Uh, we're based in the city of Tijuana. Uh, what we do pretty much is do documentary films and collaborative uh, art projects. Uh, the way we describe ourselves is uh, like a hybrid between a film production company, an art collective, and what we call a distributor of cultural goods. Uh, we are inspired by uh, uh, human dignity uh, and justice. Uh, the artisanal process of creation and the potential of collaboration to achieve the common good. And our work has been broadcast in uh, Mexico and the US on networks like KCT, PBS, uh, Canal 22, uh, Canal 52, and Univision uh, San Diego. Uh, it's also been exhibited in film festivals, museums, galleries, and universities in different uh, countries. No? Uh, the work that Paola, Jose, and I uh, started together with uh, David Figueroa and Araceli Blancarte, who are also members of Dignicraft, uh, and together with Blanca España, uh, goes further back. We actually started working since the year 2000 under a different name. Uh, our collective at the time was named Bulbo, and we had a, a company named Galatea Audiovisual. Uh, see some of the, the work we did at the time. Um, and now, Getting into uh, uh, our talk today, uh, growing up and living in the border region of Tijuana and San Diego, uh, we feel it's quite inter interesting because compared to other cities in the interior of uh, Mexico, um, you can get to see and experience how your whole life can change in an instant uh, due to the implementation of uh, <laughs> natural level uh, policies that are generated both in either in Mexico or in the US. And uh, these sometimes uh, policies have an immediate effect in our daily lives. No? Um, before going into some examples of uh, uh, some moments where we consider that these macro policies have uh, had an effect on repercussions in our lives, I'll just say that we are filmmakers, uh, we don't do academic research. Uh, so some of the issues that we're gonna talk to about, uh, I mean, we don't consider ourselves to be ex uh, experts, uh, but we're happy to share our experience uh, doing uh, documentary films. No? And we hope that what we get to share with you guys today is of interest no, to, uh, to you. And we're looking forward to any thoughts and questions uh, you might have along the way. So, so as examples of uh, some of these moments in history when uh, there's been what we consider some, not one, but maybe some uh, several uh, macro policies um, are, well, prohibition, you know, that happened between 1920 and 1933, uh, when authorities in Mexico, uh, specifically in Baja California, gave business concessions to American entrepreneurs to open casinos, uh, racetrack, and saloons. And that's uh, uh, business in Tijuana flourished, but it's also uh, uh, time that marks when uh, Tijuana's uh, Leyenda Negra, or dark myth, uh, was created, no? And that still carries a lot of uh, a burden until uh, these days, no? Then when the September 11, uh, attacks happened that marked a dramatic decline 
in tourism uh, in, in Tijuana, and it, that also had an impact on the border wait times to cross between both countries. No? Um, and then uh, most more recently, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, caused the border to be closed off for almost two years uh, for non-US residents. And what this happened is literally like uh, families were divided no, for uh, this period of time. So, uh, I mean, we're not going to dive in the, to this. These, these are just examples no, that we wanted uh, to share with you. Um, what else? Muchas gracias por tenernos aquí. Me da mucho gusto ver caras conocidas, ¿no? Personas que ya conocemos, que han visitado Tijuana también, y estar aquí en la universidad. Eh, eh, the guiding principle that our talk today is that documentary film, films are tools to explore um, or to help us explore our environment and try to understand the reality that we and other people live. Many of the projects that we done over the years are about things that happen in Tijuana or Los Angeles. Um, in the case of Tijuana, the, the projects that we're going to see are um, projects that documented these transformations that Omar was talking about, uh, moments where the, the city changed dramatically. And we had the, the, the luck to, to have the camera ready to document that. Also, in the case of Los Angeles, the, the, what we have been documenting is um, um, historical moments of the city uh, that sometimes could be overlooked, no? And and also, as Gaspar was saying, this this documentation process is from the side, from from an outsider in a sense, um, from the from the south part of the or a perspective from the south, uh, which is also interesting, no? And and we know that the experience of being in a by national environment and in the border, uh, it also helped us have some tools that are useful for for the work we do in, in Los Angeles. So um, uh, we'll talk first based on projects made in Tijuana and, and second uh, in Los Angeles by addressing them this way, we believe that uh, they provide an interesting snapshot of the complexity of life from a binational perspective. Well, uh, Tijuana is our home, and through our artistic practice, we've had the privilege to explore some of the events that have shaped the city over the previous two decades. Uh, well, uh, Gaspar already told about this, but I'm going to just give you more specifics. Uh, Bulbo was a weekly half an hour television program broadcast between 2002 and 2006 with a documentary format about the untold everyday realities of the Tijuana-San Diego border region. As part of the show, we made a little under 100 short films documentaries. Bulbo was broadcast all of Mexico and some part of the US uh, on the networks that Omar mentioned before. Uh, one motivation that we had for uh, start the project was that we didn't felt represented on the media and the local media or the broadcast or television. Um, on one hand, we had the national broadcast media produced by two major corporations in Mexico. And, and most of the content that they produced was uh, from central Mexico and this vision from the, from the center no, of Mexico. So we, uh, and also, uh, um, on the other hand, we were exposed to North American broadcast networks with content that in English that usually was alien to our uh, reality. Uh, we're going to show a, 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 sh a short clip um, as just a, to show you the, the feel and look of the, of the, of the, of the television program. Um, Bulbo's success was largely based on the fact that it documented a period of transformation in the city of Tijuana towards a city of great cultural effervescence. In that period, for example, uh, the Newsweek magazine named Tijuana one of the most, one of the 10 most creative cities of the world. We're talking, this was 2003, around that, that time. Uh, some of the conditions that led to this transformation um, create this idea of uh, Tijuana as a, as a capital of, of, of as a creative capital uh, of the world. Um, we, we feel that it's related to the transformation effects of the after the signing of NAFTA, 
which brought rapid economic growth to the region. That was one, one part of the, of the equation there. And also the sustained uh, local rejection uh, since the 1980s to centralism in, 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 the, in the local population. Politicians um, like artists and other cultural actors were, were rejecting uh, these impositions of, of uh, political and cultural impositions from central Mexico. Uh, in, in a sense, that laid the foundations uh, for a search of the city's uh, identity uh, that was also capitalized with, uh, with youth, youth people who who or young people who uh, also had access to digital tools that wasn't available before that's uh, late 90s early 2000s uh, the advent of uh, digital uh, tools not basically to be able to create and to create music and other uh, forms of expression that that uh, was also embedded in this do-it-yourself ethos that was very common in the city. And these, these uh, uh, factors created this moment of, of visibility for the city. So we documented uh, that part of, of, the, of the history of, the, of Tijuana. And we're gonna show two small excerpts of documentaries that uh, include some of these uh, characters who were uh, responsible for the, for the growth of, uh, of the image of Tijuana as a cultural uh, capital. Arte es un reflejo de la vida, ¿no? no necesariamente tiene que ser bueno o agradable o feo o bonito, simplemente es un reflejo de lo que estás viviendo. Yo lo uso para hacer un comentario social y en general pienso que es como, como hacer grilla, pero de una manera divertida. Siento que, que Acamonchi tiene, tiene muchas posibilidades y, y me gusta hacer política pero al mismo tiempo me gusta gozar y me gusta divertirme con lo que estoy haciendo. Me gusta enfocar todo esto de una manera constructiva. No puedes hacer un cambio significativo en, en la política actual, simplemente te ves afectado por lo que pasa. Buscas un, un, una manera de darle salidas a todas esas inquietudes, frustraciones o sentimientos, pues tal vez negativos. En el caso particular de Camonchi es haciendo gráficos ¿no? y tratar de de burlarse de todo ese tipo de, de cuestiones y esa es una de las características que puedo definir el proyecto, definitivamente el humor es algo negable. Cosas que no son tan predecibles, a mí me interesa celebrar la cultura popular mexicana. Lo que me gusta es celebrar la chapez a Valentín Trujillo o a Evelyn La Puente ¿no? ah. o al Mago Frank. La instalación de, no sé, primero fueron 40 pies y después fueron ¿qué? como 70 pies cuadrados o más de las dos salas del mezanín y, y duró bastante tiempo, ¿no? Fue la cuna de Norte y todo eso y, y ahí estaba, ¿no? Y me tocó pues andar en, en, poniendo calcomanías en las calles, en otras partes y pósters o convenciendo a gente que pusiera stenciles en, en otras partes y se empezó a salir de control. <risa> Dentro, dentro de tu computadora en un software y, y no necesitan más que eso. Las bases de la música electrónica siempre van a ser anglo, siempre, toda la vida. Entonces no hay manera de, de no importa de dónde seamos, de, de escaparnos de no ser influenciados por, por los sonidos anglosajones, porque básicamente de ahí empezó.
Tijuaneados Anónimos originally conceived as a public art project. Tijuaneados Anónimos, a teardrop and a smile, is a collective reflection through various media on our roles as citizens. The power we have and the possibilities of imagining together <coughs> how to improve our environment. The project includes a 12-step program recovery group, a feature-length documentary, and a museum exhibition, among other components. In Tijuana in 2008, we experienced one of the most terrible crises of violence and ungovernability in the history of the city. Shootings, murders, kidnappings, poor urban planning, and drug trafficking were words we heard and saw every day in the news and affected our daily lives. The following is a film a trailer of Tijuaneados Anonymous, the document. <coughs> Tijuana está condenada por su geografía. Tendríamos nosotros que invadir Estados Unidos o que ellos nos invadan a nosotros y que se recorra la frontera para que Tijuana deje de ser la joya de la corona de cualquier negocio ilegal. Pues yo, yo en lo personal, si, si no tengo nada que hacer en la calle, no salgo por la, la inseguridad por la cual estoy viviendo. Yo no creo que sea un rollo mediatizado. Pues ahí están las cifras, pero cuando no te toca, entonces no existe. Hola compañeros, yo soy Juan Eduardo y soy tijuaneado. Hola, Juan. Hola, Juan. Algo anda mal con la ciudad. Al principio a lo mejor parecíamos unos locos que estábamos centrados en lo negativo. Podríamos hacer, poner en fila los encabezados de los periódicos de un año para acá y sacar un promedio de notas explosivas, ¿no? Pues tenemos el gobierno que nos merecemos, ¿no? O sea, que le vale madre porque a nosotros nos vale madre, ¿no? Entonces, el sentido de este grupo tiene... La respuesta tan simple y a la vez tan difícil, ¿no? De que las cosas cambien, que es cambiar comenzando por uno mismo. Si yo me hago un poco más, más consciente, Tijuana es ahorita, en este momento, no importa de dónde yo venga, Tijuana es mi casa. Hoy, en este día, Tijuana es mi casa. Si la ciudad es la suma de todos, voy a cooperar con ese granito de arena para que esta ciudad sea diferente, pero, pero yo tengo que empezar conmigo misma. Es una ciudad muy noble, sí, pero es una ciudad a la que la gente demasiado o no la tributa demasiado, es decir, es una ciudad sin mucha identidad. As background of this situation, in 2006, the administration of President Felipe Calderón declared a war against the drug cartels in Mexico, increasing the levels of violent acts in Tijuana to an unprecedented levels. The city felt desolate and hopeless. There were also citizen demonstrations against violence. The attitude of the Tijuaneados Anonymous Recovery Group members motivated us to make the documentary. We did echo to the conversations beyond the four walls of the space where they met. Tijuanados Anonymous explored the role, the role of pain and empathy play in motivating a person to seek change. So in that first decade of the 2000s, we went from a, a celebratory period of cultural vibrancy to polar opposite, no, to the violence, no? And by... 2011, around that time, uh, many of Tijuana's businesses uh, lost their customers and tenants because tourism uh, dropped. And the city became like a ghost town, like literally. You know? uh, what's interesting is that Tijuana's community of artists and young entrepreneurs began to reimagine and reinvigorate the downtown historic tourist district uh, by opening uh, small, independent, largely self-funded art galleries, cafes, bookstores, boutiques, you name it, no? uh, among many other examples of small enterprises. No? And what this led to a transformation of that particular area into a hot spot with cutting edge, you know, artwork, gastronomy, and culture. No? Uh, in 2013, we did a short uh, documentary for KCT 
titled Pasajes Addressing What Was Happening in the Downtown Area After This Strong Period of uh, Violence. No, and this is a, a clip of that short film. <coughs> The experience of a city is a lot like the experience of a labyrinth, and I think that's just amplified in a place like Tijuana, where a lot of the architecture does have these interior, exterior spaces, which is how I would term it, I guess. Um, so you'll come into a pasaje, like, uh, or, or you can pass by the pasaje a thousand times before recognizing that there is this, like, interior street. Um, and then within this interior street, there's even additional interior streets, and it kind of nested in that way. And I think that as I explore the labyrinth of the idea that is Tijuana, I've also realized that it's reflected in like the physical architecture of the city. And that's true, especially in, well, I mean, most clearly in the case of the Pasajes, which, uh, which, which flow unexpectedly from major avenues and then become their own major avenues which yield further interiorities between buildings um, and I, I think that's really interesting because it, it, it uh, yeah it takes advantage of all these all these unexpected territories and I mean and that's very much Tijuana as well yeah. you know like you see the architecture you see the use you see the use of space in, in Tijuana mm -hmm. it's very much it's very resourceful it's very um, you know, multi-purpose, it's, it's very flexible yeah. uh, and I think that, that artists have aesthetically responded to that in the past but it's not just kind of taking on that informality aesthetically but really uh, activating what that informality could be in mm -hmm. terms of trans transforming space and again transforming an entire portion of the city and really trying to repurpose what what this space could be for the city itself. One of the things that helped spark uh, the change in the city was the low rent of all the properties that had closed down, especially along uh, the series of those alleyways that are connected to Avenida Revolución. And Avenida Revolución is like the main downtown thoroughfare and tourist uh, center. Uh, this enabled a new generation of people uh, from both Tijuana and north of the border to experiment with different uh, business ideas and creative ventures that were really unprecedented for the legacy of that particular area. And uh, Pasajes was a way uh, for us to explore the role of the city's artistic community uh, to channel its creativity and motivation to transform the downtown area and create a sense uh, for us to re of reclaiming uh, Tijuana. And then in 2016, no, see, in 2016, an estimated of 30,000 Haitians migrants arrived in Tijuana and Baja California. The Haitians migrants are said to have made their way from Brazil through Central America and Mexico to reach the US-Mexico border. Most Haitians left their country years ago due to a combination of natural disasters, gun violence, political corruption, and poverty. Local and federal authorities in Tijuana were late to respond to the situation, and shelters were overwhelmed with the amount of people seeking help. This is a brief trailer for another short documentary we did for KCT, titled Fotoperiodista documenting Tijuana refugee crisis. crisis. La verdad es que el tema de los refugiados en el mundo siempre me ha llamado la atención. Y de alguna forma tener la espinita de documentar eso. Aquí inició todo con cientos de haitianos empujándose, aglomerándose con, 
con la intención de conseguir en la caseta de inmigración un pase para poder entrevistarse con un agente de inmigración norteamericano. Yo empecé a documentar desde un principio eso. Trato de buscar lo positivo de las cosas, como fotógrafo. No todos son infelices, hay personas que vienen sufriendo y vienen de ver gente morir en el camino, pero llegan aquí, llegan con una, pues llegan con una actitud que te, que te cautiva, que te hace aprender de la vida. Que por más que sufran, por más que vengan con carencias o que hayan dejado a toda su familia, ellos vienen aquí y vienen como unos guerreros. Mi nombre es Omar Martínez y soy fotoperiodista. El film por Trace Work of the Tijuana Photojournalist Omar Martínez, covering the situation of the Haitian migrants who had arrived in the city in search of applying for a humanitarian visa to, the, to enter to the United States. Through the work of the, of the photojournalist, the film shows the problem from a human perspective and proposes a look of empathy and understanding of the phenomenon of, of migration. In response to public policies from Mexico and the US that have fostered the creation of migrant caravans, new generations of the artists and activist communities have merged to address the situation, creating a network of, of, for migrant care and provide support for people waiting to cross the border or who decide to make Tijuana their home. And then, uh... The way we came to LA was since 2013, our artistic practice uh, have led us to connect with the KCP Public Television Network, doing commissioning, commission documentaries for Urban and other programs. Um, each of these projects has been an opportunity for us to explore the experience of the Chicano, Mexican-American, Latino, and immigrant communities. We are uh, going to share a little of what we learn about Los Angeles through these documentaries, making them from our perspective working on the border. Um, the first one is Artesanos, uh, which is based on uh, of previous research and projects addressing traditional craft in Mexico. Uh, and then we saw the opportunity to make a feature length documentary about the highly skilled artisans that migrated from Mexico who are the backbone of quality design and retail in Los Angeles, producing some of the most exquisite furniture, textile, and design goods. However, these artisans represent a creative force that seems invisible to the city, playing an important role in making Los Angeles one of the creative capitals of the world. And here's the, the trailer for this film. It's really interesting to consider the relationships between these different puzzle pieces of the city. The goods, the services, the labor, they're all making these journeys from the nice west side to the more blue collar south side, industrial east side. There's these travels going on within Los Angeles. All of the migrants in, in the city bring something with them. And in the case of Mexican migrants, you still had a very strong tradition of craftsmanship and trades. These kind of crafts work, which requires a lot of intuition, requires other forms of knowledge that sometimes aren't taught in art schools. Lo sientes, aunque es caliente, lo manejo con la mano y haz de cuenta que lo formara con la mano. Aunque no es con la mano, es con la herramienta, con el papel mojado, pero sí lo sientes. You can ask anything that you want to be produced and there is a craftsman in this city. They just leave in the shadows, but they're there. Lo mismo que estás haciendo un mueble con aquel entusiasmo, aquel cariño. Lo mismo lo hago con los caballos, vengo, los peino, los acaricio. Les transmito ese cariño. Venimos de guerreros. Siempre tratamos de luchar por nuestra familia, por lo que queremos. No cruzamos una frontera para venir aquí a, a terminar en la calle. The skill and the craft and the craftsman behind the making of products are a very essential part of the process. Charles Eames' definition of craftsmanship was that craftsmanship is the same as saying well made. I am a maker, and as a maker, I'm a better designer. Because of their hands-on 
each object is a little bit different from the other one that was just made a half hour ago. So I would say that they really have a true connection with the material. It is a challenging fixture in and of itself, like how it lights up and down. There's lots of complexities. We immediately thought maybe this is the chance that we can kind of work with someone who works with glass or in metal. Maybe together we can create the missing piece. Artesanus was a way to, uh, for us to explore how migration contributes to the development and economy of Los Angeles. By the time we did the film in 2016, we had already done a few film and art projects with artisans in Mexico and here in LA, where we <laughs> realized there was what seemed like a network uh, of artisans in South and Southeastern parts of the city, making high-end goods <clears throat> like furniture, shoes, and accessories being sold in places like Brentwood, Hollywood, and Pasadena. This film is an example of how migration contributes to the development and economy of the city. The work of these artisans is part of the creative industries. And at that time, LA was talked about as a creative capital, an attractive place for the creative industries. However, the role of these artisans in making uh, the city a creative cap capital seem, seem to remain invisible. People buying the goods weren't aware that they were by, being done in LA by migrants. In, in 2018, uh, we got commissioned uh, to make a film connected with the Chicano community in LA titled La Raza, that uh, Asfar mentioned earlier. And the story uh, for this film is set in East Los Angeles during the late 60s and the 1970s. Uh, when a group of young activists use creative tools like writing and photography as a means for community organizing, uh, providing a platform for the Chicano movement in the form of the bilingual newspaper and magazine uh, titled La Raza. In the process, uh, these young activists became artists themselves and articulated a visual language that shed light on the daily life concerns and struggles of the Mexican-American experience in Southern California and provided a voice for the Chicano uh, rights movement. Uh, the work uh, made by these young activists and photographers generated an archive of nearly 25,000 uh, images that defined the pivotal moments, the key players and the symbols of Chicano activism. This is the uh, film clip of the uh, documentary. <laughs> La Raza was a newspaper in East Los Angeles. It was the paper that recorded the demonstrations and the organizing, talked about the meetings that occurred, and also talked about the issues of concern to the East LA Chicano community. You had a movement that was taking place amongst a broad community that La Raza as a publication was a part of and was reporting on and giving coverage that they would never have gotten otherwise because mainstream media was limited and was not interested in the subject. Uh, a lot of us wanted to bring out the truth of who we were. We wanted to come out with our own news, with our own version, with our own story. La Raza newspaper was one of the key instruments, tools that we used to then communicate 
our ideology of Chicanismo, the equivalent to what is today Facebook and Twitter. That's how we got the message out. Now, since the Mexican-American War uh, in the, 19th, in the 1840s, uh, when Mexico lost a big part of land and the actual border between both countries uh, was created, uh, there's been a disconnect between the people of Mexico and the Mexican citizens who stayed on the northern side. Um, the history of the Mexican-American community, you can say, is pretty much unknown uh, in Mexico. And we need to create more awareness of this history since it's also part of the history of Mexico. Uh, our histories are, are different, obviously, um, depending on which side of the border you are, but we also have so much in common and you have to take into account uh, all the interaction that there is between uh, our communities We're coming back, uh, uh, back and forward. Um, so, we feel that our experiences should be approached as part of the whole history of Mexico. Um, also, uh, when doing this film, we were interested in the fact that uh, many of the members of La Raza uh, were young uh, and formed themselves on the fly while doing things. And you could tell, I, I mean, uh, speaking with them, there was this feeling of vibrancy that uh, took us back to Tijuana 20 years ago. You know, it kind of felt like when we were uh, learning uh, the ropes on doing things. No? Um, this served as a guide also when, when viewing their photos and their archive uh, to better select which images to choose from each uh, photographer. Uh, but we have the experience of learning about this history firsthand uh, from each of the participants and, and the way uh, these young people work uh, it's a reference that should inspire other young people to do uh, things, no? Um, and it also, I would add, just change the way uh, we think of archives and documenting things, uh, the value that these archives have to uh, better understand uh, our histories and to tell it from an insider's perspective. No? And then the following year, we did a film about the Day of the Dead celebration in Los Angeles. Dia de los Muertos has been adapted for centuries from its pre-colonial roots to the popular representation in mass media today. The tradition was brought to East, LA, East Los Angeles in 1970s as a way to enrich and reclaim Chicano identity to a small celebration <coughs> at self Graphics and Art. Since then, the celebration was grown in proportions with in communities all around the world. In contrast to all the glamour that Day of the Dead now receives, we did this film to explore uh, a more intimate look at this ritual through the story of Mexican-American artist Ofelia Esparza, who travels to Guanimar, Guanajuato, in search of her ancestral roots, and Rufina Marcial from the Zapotec community who maintains her traditions in Oaxaca, California. And here we're going to see a clip of Day of the Dead. Dia de los Muertos for me is something that is very much LA that was revived by the artist community in the early 70s in Los Angeles through self-help graphics. And so the Chicana Chicano artists really had a lot to do with the shaping of what Day of the Dead looked like here, you know, in California and also throughout the Southwest. As people migrated to the United States, they brought this holiday with them. In reproducing Day of the Dead here in Los Angeles, Zapotecs, I think, have this responsibility because hands down without question it is the most important celebration for Zapotecs on both sides of the border. It's a holiday created from a clashing and a combining of cultures and people taking what's important from each and making something new, something vibrant, something beautiful, and something that has meaning for them as they are at that point. Now that it's practiced in very modern 
urban situations where diverse cultures have their own way of being and expressing, there's that level of syncretism. Maybe we could say modern life has also impacted how the tradition is practiced. Um, this film was uh, an opportunity for us to address the diversity and richness of the Latino community by following the stories of Ofelia Esparza, who was born in, in the U.S., but is a descendant from the Purepech indigenous community of Michoacán, together with Rufina Marcial, who is a first-generation migrant who's part of the large Zapotec community of Los Angeles. Um, we also saw how culture can express in a foreign context such as the Day of the Dead in the U.S. and how it can be transformed in many ways uh, that could coexist. The celebration can be a political form of resistance to make a community visible, as we saw in the case of social graphics and art uh, and the Chicano community, but it can also be a, an intimate and cyclical tradition that it's lived uh, within the homes um, that we also saw uh, at, within the homes and that extraneous uh, communality that we saw with, with the case of Rufina Marcial. Uh, the same, at the same time, uh, it can be a, spe a spectacular party that serves as a vehicle to manifest individuality in the case of the Hollywood Forever Cemetery uh, celebration. And a few years later, uh, we had the opportunity to further explore the growth and the diversity of the Latino community uh, with another film, this one titled 187, The Rise of the Latino Vote. Uh, Proposition 187 was a California ballot measure uh, passed in 1994 that sought to deny public services to undocumented immigrants. While the, the initiative was meant to keep, quote unquote, the immigrant threat uh, at bay, it mobilized non-immigrants and uh, immigrants in Latino communities as well as their allies across uh, the state. You know? and. The political awakening of this powerful uh, group would dramatically change the state's electoral politics, transforming the state into a blue and progressive state for the first time. Uh, Proposition 187 created uh, new and enduring political fault lines across California and across the nation, as well as molded the political careers of the new generation of leaders. No, we're going to show you the uh, trailer for the documentary. Our nation's immigration laws must be enforced. They keep coming. Two million illegals in California. They're using our system against us. It is one of the most controversial and bitterly contested ballot measures in California's political history. Prop 187 would make illegal aliens ineligible for public social services. It would require doctors, nurses, teachers to report to the INS if you suspected that that child or that family were undocumented suspected if this doesn't wake up our community nothing will this is the beginning people understood they have to vote that that was the only way one million new latino voters our representation is a direct result of how our community has responded to proposition 187. the route for america should probably be the route that we took here in california to move past the racial animus that is gripping the nation right now 187 the rise of the Latino vote. The era of Prop 187 marks a moment in Los Angeles history uh, when the Latino community came together with the immigrant uh, community. Uh, Latinos born in the U.S. formed an alliance with first-generation uh, migrants to organize their people and confront uh, this proposed law that took away uh, their rights. Now, this alliance was even broader uh, because uh, it also uh, merged with the African-American and Nation uh, American communities. Um, at the time that we were making this film, uh, we saw many similarities uh, that were seen between the events that took place in L.A. Uh, during um, the 90s with what was going on at the moment. And we were literally in lockdown. Uh, and I remember clearly we were going through uh, archival materials, uh, for instance, of uh, when Rodney King was uh, being uh, uh, beat up by uh, police officers and then the riots. And I uh, remember we would 
uh, finish the work of the day and then go online to see what was going on. And you would see images of uh, George uh, Floyd uh, being beat down by police and then the riots. And But not only that, then uh, you would see images and we would go through news clips of the early 1990s recession. And then we had the COVID-19 recession happening at the time. Uh, on top of that, then there were natural disasters in the 90s, like the <clears throat> North, Northridge earthquake and the Old Topanga and North Valley Boo fires, and then the California wildfires happening at the time. And it was just uh, crazy because at least visually what we were looking at uh, felt like it was the, the same thing. You know, and, and then on top of that was a lockdown, it was just difficult. No? Um, now, Prop 187 made uh, scapegoats of undocumented immigrants uh, for problems in California. And then 25 years later, there were similar conditions, but, but at the national uh, level. So uh, what this documentary film suggests is that the experience of the 90s in California uh, may have keys uh, to face the present, you know, at least the present that we were going through between 2019 and 2021. 20, uh, you know? um, and I'll, I'll just close off saying that uh, it's very challenging for us to talk uh, about uh, the, the work we've done because each film or, or art project feels like a, it's like tapping into a different world and you can talk for hours about uh, each uh, subject. No? Uh, but it's also interesting for us to uh, talk briefly about each one and talk about them together because they all feel like a small piece of a bigger puzzle that together help us understand. In, in this case, we're talking about our hometown, Tijuana, and, and then Los Angeles, which is not our hometown, but it's a city that we, uh, where we spend a lot of time. In, and we've been fortunate uh, to do a lot of uh, projects and continue doing projects here. So uh, yeah, that's it. No, uh, hope it's, you found it interesting and really looking forward to any thoughts or questions. Uh, that you might have or to add to the conversation. Let's open it up for discussion. This was great. I really enjoyed, uh, you know, this overview of your work, some of which I'd seen before the more recent things, but not the older stuff I'd never seen. So, um, I'm a historian, so one, so this is kind of this is the historian question. But I'm really curious, what's it, what do you see? It's like the difference. Your earlier stuff, you're you're sort of documenting the now, and then and like in 187, you're 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 looking through archival stuff. How 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 do you, and also in La Raza and the other as documentarians, what um, reflections do you have about the difference between? documenting the now and the then and their relationship. <laughs> um, I will say like what, what's interesting is how how the like the time is captured in, in the documents you no know? and, and and you can see that the the contrast of of the way we see life in that period now. So because in the case of La Raza, I think it's, it's, it was very interesting, like the way they um, approached the work, it, it was a collective, like creating images and, and publishing ideas. And, and the, way, the way they were organized, we felt totally connected with that because it was the same uh, approach that we have as a collective and, and also publishing and, and documenting stuff. So that was the initial connection. And then you can, you have a reference in a personal level that you can see through the work of them at that, at that period that you, you know what they might be experiencing in, in that process. No, it's, you have a personal experience that you can relate, which is very uh, important not to connect with that area. And that's, we were trying to mention this, but it, it was important for us to, at the time of selecting what to include in the document it was that time type of stuff that it was uh, this when we have this connection no? that we can we will have some 
another reference and another guide that will help us decide which which images to to select. Also, the 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 process of this is documented in the present because you're talking with a with a person who lived that past and so the opportunity to talk with with them the the, the main characters no were, were people who were uh, like very relevant participants of that movement no so <laughs> they still have this energy and this passion for the for the theme no just to to learn from them uh it was easy to to pinpoint the specific moments in time that were very re that resonate with them today that that it was like 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 they can depict the moments very lightly um and then we just from that collection of of references we just went also to see in the archive which of those events were uh documented with different cameras and uh, with different approaches and we tried to create this um like oral history uh, within the, the people who participated in it. Thank you. I'll just add that it's uh, it's very challenging when we do when we've done things in Tijuana uh, because yeah it's like things are happening as we're documenting and so the feeling sometimes is like confusion because you don't know what the outcome is going to be especially sometimes as uh, uh, with uh, issues that are as uh, polarizing as, for instance, when the Haitian community arrived in Tijuana and people were talking, you know, uh, in favor and against it, no? Uh, so you feel like you're in the middle of a hurricane and you're trying to make sense to articulate uh, this, this, this story. But then once it's done, it's like, and you show it to your community, it's like everyone feels entitled that they have a word because it's like we share the same home. Uh, and, and, and in that case, that case of Foto Periodista, uh, I think our approach to documentary filmmaking is very collaborative. Uh, and usually, and, and it's actually uh, some uh, fusion between the yes filmmaking, but also doing collaborative art projects. And sometimes what this means, for instance, with Foto Periodista is that once the film was done, we were lucky to uh, act quickly well, things were doing going because it was a short film, uh, uh, and we, after doing it, we did a screening event at the Secud, the cultural center in Tijuana, and that was the first event in Tijuana uh, where it was like openly acknowledging the presence of the Haitian people there, and that meant okay, we're gonna do a panel and we're gonna have people from Tijuana and people from the Haitian community together. And we're going to ask people from the shelter to come and cook food for us. And we're going to pay them. And we're going to have a big celebration. And literally, it's a, the first time for many people from Tijuana to be close with people from Haiti and see each other and, and talk. You know? And so the, the rewarding thing there was that we have the opportunity to use the film to make a change in, in the city. And, and I, I think, I mean, we might not have a way to prove it right now, but that it changed the discourse towards uh, the Haitian community at the time. A little later, uh, this obviously wasn't part of the film, but there was like a, 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 the first march against uh, uh, migration in Tijuana. And so there was a fight going on, no, it was tough. And then in, in being in, in Los Angeles, uh, it's funny because uh, again, it's like you don't, you start to try to make sense of things after they happen, no? And you look back, no? And and yes, uh, <coughs> looking back, it's like uh, many of the films we've done in Los Angeles are about things that already happened, no? But uh, at the same time, as Jose mentioned, it's like we you you focus on the common things you have with the people you are going to be collaborating with. And usually that means uh, uh, people learning uh, about history firsthand, uh, like people telling you things. And it usually it ends up making, for us making a connection with something we lived through in Tijuana. Um, but again, it's like, it also feels like each, that with each project that we do, and I think it's because of this collaborative aspect uh, that we have as a collective, is that you feel like a different person when you finish each project. It's like you feel transformed. 
and 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 that makes it all feel like our practice like a life journey that it's exciting and each thing that comes is like just changed your whole approach towards life no and to engaging a city in a specific place anyone else Patricia? Yeah. 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 Hi, uh, well, thanks so much for this presentation and for like walking us through your own history, right? As a collective documentary. So I, I'm curious because you're a collective, right? Documentary filmmakers. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about like how do you go about decision making, right? For example, like how do you go about selecting the topics that you're going to be working on and about all the types of decisions, right? Like the like technical or artistic, like how do you go about that? Mm. I think a, 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 each of us has like a, an idea of how we do it, but I think we spend most of the time together, like <laughs> like 16 hours a day or 12, and we are like a, more like a family that he don't need to say what he's thinking because I know what he's thinking. <laughs> so sometimes we are like always talking about something, like for example, I don't know, the shelters, and we're talking and talk, and then we say, Oh, there's the opportunity to make a a documentary. But the idea is like always in there, and we're always talking about that like while we're eating or something. And then like it, it se concreta así, eh, for something that someone invites us or commission a work or something like that. And most of the time, the idea is eh, from everybody, but every, everyone has like a special thing he can do. Like eh, Omar, well, as you can see, he's very good talking and doing like those kind of things. And Jose Luis is very good like directing and with technical stuff. And I think I can like organize things. Yeah. But I, don't say. yeah I, will, I will say that it's uh, usually ideas are evolving. Uh, sometimes we ended up with nothing like with a, sometimes we messed up and came out with an idea that when we presented to someone else, uh, they are like looking at us like crazy <laughs> people, like what do you want from us or something like that. So it happens like that, but, but usually it's a, a process of uh, <laughs> Uh, enriching the, the idea through the input of, of all of us. And Omar was mentioning also the, the collaborative uh, process. We also like to, uh, when we're doing any project, we, we like to talk with the people who's gonna be involved, uh, even in front of the camera. That That's uh, very important for us to, to really understand what they want to say and, and try to balance um, the project as a vehicle for their saying and also what we want to say because if we are we want to say something through the work no but in balance with with the other no so that's kind of fun and uh, i think that's important because sometimes omar see uh, certain kind of things and because it's on earth and when we get together like we said from different perspectives or different details of people or of life or thank you Yes, thank you for, for sharing all your good stuff. I know you guys yeah. from the Pro 170. Uh, I have a question disregarding more security because you guys cross over production, come to United States, it's easy and relaxed. So how is the situation for someone like me going into Tijuana? Special going around with equipment. Do you have any, in your experience, do you have any secret system when you go out, or what is that your recommendation? Well, uh, I, I mean, I guess there's always challenges between going back and forth, going to like one world and then another, and you have to like change frequencies and and just rhythms are different, the way to connect with people. But um, uh, for us, uh, I think it's worked better. And this, again, has been something organic that has been developing and still developing. But I would say like to have a team here and a team in Mexico. 
and, and try to be as sufficient as we can to carry less, the less stuff you carry, the better it is uh, at the end of the day. Of the day. But thinking of uh, uh, Mexico right now, uh, I, I mean, we're going through some tough times and things have been going on for almost uh, 20 years now or more than one. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we've been doing, for instance, the, the film we're going to show in uh, October 4th uh, at Self-Help Graphics and Art uh, titled El Ojo de Agua de los Galvez was made in a very, very rural rancheria in the state of Jalisco near the border between Zacatecas and Jalisco. And that's a very dangerous place uh, right now. But at the same time, it's like a lot of places in Mexico are very dangerous. And Tijuana is one of those. And, and <coughs> there. But obviously, for us living there, it's like, you know your way around. But when we go to a place like that rancheria in Jalisco, it's like, we know we, we can't go on our own. You know, we need to connect with someone you know, who is from there that'll guide us. No? Uh, so I, I would uh, suggest that if you were to go to Tijuana, the same thing. I mean, call us or anyone that you know that will help you and show you around. Uh, and this can trickle down to all levels of life. Uh, remember, uh, when before we did started with Bulbo, uh, when we began our first company, we did not have like one penny to do things. Uh, uh, and but what we had a lot of uh, uh, contacts of rock bands. So the first thing we did as a unit was do punk shows. Um, and I remember, so the challenge there was like all oh, these bands touring from outside coming through the US would cross the border with all this equipment. So we would cross the border, meet them in Chula Vista and cross together with them just to make sure, you know, that there was someone with them that if the official uh, were giving them a hard time, you they see a local and it's different now. No? So that's maybe I'm getting, going off here on a tangent, but uh, it's the same thing, you know, to uh, be together with someone and meter el cuerpo, I would say, no. And, and I will add, like, just uh, plan to, to be light on the equipment that you bring. Like, now there's, like, fantastic cameras, very small, and. Uh, so it's a, a, a light setup, low, low profile kind of. That would be another suggestion. Uh, just to keep it low, low. Low profile. Yeah, low profile, a, a small crew, uh, small cameras, stuff like that. That, that will also be a, a good, good way to go. Okay. So I would like to help you to echar más crema. <laughs> Because what we, I know that we have very close, very, very good friends and collaborators. And uh, what they have brought to your attention is basically just a small glimpse of what they do, I have to say. <laughs> so I would like you to talk a little bit more, even if it's very briefly, about other areas of your uh, filming uh, actually work. And not only filming work, because you are also doing a collaborative collaborative work and artistic projects beyond filming mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about Basalto <clears throat> so uh, if you could talk a little bit about Basalto if you could also mention I would love okay. to hear uh, about Tierra uh, Brillante oh, yeah. uh, also about Comita y Valentin which is basically entering a relatively only different terrain because it's, it's on migration again though not at the california border but at the, at the arizona uh, border and again uh, also i don't know if you are uh, allowed or if you would like to talk about yet another <coughs> in the making mm -hmm. uh, you also did not talk about los hermanos hernandez which is amazing <laughs> <laughs> so just to help you understand that again Picnic yeah. craft is a whole universe, and they showed just just a little piece of it. Thank you for <laughs> the remarks. Um, well, thinking on the collaborative spirit, we uh, like projects. Sometimes one project takes you to another uh, in a ways that are not necessarily directly. For example, Iguanillos Anonymous was a project that connected with different people in different ways. But for example, we ended up like. Uh, having a, a, an invitation to to participate in a Mites class presenting that that film that was 
four or five years ago, uh, I will say like four or five years ago. And through that experience, we ended up became friends and, uh, and also Mike invited us to, to collaborate in a, in a documentary that's now on the making and it's called Jovite Valentin, which tells the story of two, two migrants whom, whose stories could be invisible and we're trying to to see the, the impact that um, their deaths in the desert of Arizona, uh, Arizona desert uh, had in, in, in their communities uh, of origin. Uh, so we, we, we follow that thread on going to central Mexico, specifically to Puebla and, and Hidalgo and, and to learn what, what was the implications from, for the death of these two persons. No? Um, and it's been interesting because it's a, it's a project that it's based on, on Maite's research and Jonathan Christmas research on Joining the subject. Yeah. Online, I think. Uh -huh. is oh, yeah. Hi, <laughs> hi to Jonathan. So it's, it's based on, on their research. Uh, it's, it's very uh, deep, the, the, the amount of information that they already had uh, when we uh, jumped in the project. Um, and now we are uh, trying to finish it. Uh, we are in the post-production phase of it, and we are most likely going to finish it by the end of the year. Uh, it's going to be a feature-length documentary, more uh, more toward like uh, film festivals and more like a cinematic kind of uh, documentary. And it, it's challenging for us because we've been uh, documenting rough uh, stuff, but. Uh, Migrant that is is, uh, is touching and it's very very impressive, no, to to work around that. Um, and we are learning a lot uh, uh, on the complexities of, of migration. We thought that we knew a little bit of of, of the phenomenon, but it's, it's totally uh, it's very very complex, no. So that's one project. I don't know if you want to talk about or Basalto or or, uh, or I'll say well Bas Basalto is uh, a space we have just outside of uh, Mexico City. It's located in the state of Mexico in uh, a municipality of Chalco. Uh, and it's a space we opened in 2019. And, and we call it like a space for the exchange of uh, knowledge uh, and culture. And we have, a, it's a big property. We have a, a, a warehouse uh, that we're using for uh, arts activities. We've had like people, guests from artists, some artists from here, from Los Angeles, like Dewey Tafoya from the master printer from Self-Help Graphics and Art, <coughs> come down, spend time with us. And what we do is we become like a bridge between uh, our guests and people from the community. And in the case of, uh, of Dewey, we did a project called Periferia Grafica uh, that involved all us collaborating with artists from the region uh, who are, there's like this movement happening outside of Mexico City that's uh, kind of reclaiming uh, being from the periphery and, and your culture and like standing uh, and trying to bypass like, you know, all the decision making happening uh, in Mexico City, at least from the uh, uh, world of the art. Uh, oh, that's Basalto. Okay. So that's the, the nave, the warehouse. This is our milpa. Uh, we, since 2019, have started learning how to uh, sembrar maíz. Uh, and then we have a soccer court, uh, soccer seven court. Uh, so, so it's sports, agriculture, and art. Those are the three uh, uh, areas that we're working with. And sports, uh, soccer obviously is huge in Mexico. And that's like our connection to the community because we have families coming in every week uh, uh, spending time there, and and uh, and uh, the town where we're at, which is called Ayotzingo, it's uh, an agricultural town, so a lot of people uh, work uh, with the soil there, and uh, and learning uh, the milpa is also a way for us to connect uh, with the community, and I will say that uh, this did not happen out of the blue. Uh, and it actually goes back to when we started doing uh, that project named Bulbo. Uh, we, I remember we did not have any experience doing uh, television at the time. Uh, most, a lot of us were like in our early 
uh, mid twenties. And, but I do remember clearly, and we were a bigger group um, that we did a list of premises that we were gonna do approach uh, making the, the television show. And on that list, for instance, we had that uh, we were gonna learn from people who were participating and who were gonna be on screen and we were gonna let them guide us. Um, so what happened along the way was that uh, uh, we, we knew that we had a big responsibility in doing whatever is we were gonna be portraying on screen. So we were on, on it together with whoever was participating with us. And sometimes this uh, collaboration went to the point of having uh, our guests sitting with us editing together and making the decisions together on what to put in and not. Uh, so realizing this uh, fast forward many years and we realized that the key, the essence of what we do, no matter if it's a film or it's a project like Basalto is to create conditions for things to happen. Once you create the conditions, what can happen to go anyway, uh, you don't really have control over it, but that's part of the practice of trying to channel things and see what the result. Uh, but the, there's a uh, strong artistic value in that collaboration and that process of doing things together. And what we've been doing over these 20 years is just uh, taking it a step further with, with each project and going further and seeing how far we can go. And Basalto, I would say, is like the uh, a culmination of, uh, of uh, more, a little over 20 years of practice. And, and it's, we're still in, <coughs> in, in the, that struggle to see where uh, uh, we just started, no? to see where it goes. No? And the other, Maite was saying is Tierra Brillante, it's brilliant, sorry. And it's a documentary we did in 2010. And it's about how lead in the pigments for the artesanías, ceramics. for the ceramics, it affects the artisans. And not, not the clients, the artisans are the more affect, the most affected. And we did that in Michoacán in a Purepecha community. So we get very close to an artisan, that, her name is Erlinda Morales. We are still friends of Erlinda. And like she's like telling the story of how it affects the, the artisans. And it, it's a beautiful story. Yeah, and, and it was an opportunity for us to be close to uh, an indigenous community in, in Mexico because uh, as you know, Mexico is very, um, uh, it's very classist and, and sometimes racist. And you end up like being, like growing and not, not necessarily uh, being in touch with uh, all the diversity that, that the, the country has, no, in terms of, of populations and, and ethnicities and all that. So you, you might be in, growing in a bubble and so for us was was uh, an experience to be close to to this community uh, and we learn a lot and what what resonated again a lot with us was the these uh, aspects of, of communality and and sharing sharing resources and and being in a in a way in a collective, not being part of, of a community, and for us because we've been working as a collective was was something that connected really quickly, and, and then we learn a lot. We've been we've been learning uh, during the process, and still we are connected with them and with other um, communities that are part of this diaspora because uh, the the Purepecha, People are 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 all over the United States and, and also part of Mexico. So we we've been trying to follow that also as well. Uh, can I read you two questions before going to you uh, from folks participating in sure. Facebook Live? And Sochi Flores Marisal says hello, and also she wanted to know about uh, Basalto. So 
you answer that question. Our colleague from Labor Studies and Chicano Studies, Virginia Spino, is asking, um, uh, uh, I find your documentary films both uh, poetic and informative. Who are your influences in terms of documentary film or cinema in general? And what are your most C films? <laughs> That's a tough way. Uh, well, first, uh, hola, Virginia. It's really nice uh, 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 to hear from you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I don't know if we have a right answer for that because we might like como uh, desilusionar. Uh, 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 because. For instance, Paola studied Hispanic literature. Uh, Jose is a lawyer. Uh, I studied communication, but uh, I mean, yes, I studied communication, but not filmmaking, not study how to, you know, it, it's like when we started working together, we really didn't know how to do the things that we do now. Uh, we've been learning along the way. So, so yes, there are a lot of films that we love, but, like, I mean, we don't even have the time to watch, you know, <laughs> sit down and watch a couple hours of, of, of films. Uh, but I don't know, obviously documentaries are uh, one thing that we were inclined towards. Uh, and I don't know, you want to name some? No, no, I, I, I will say the same. We, we, don't, we don't have time to see a lot of films. It, most recently, it's, it's very difficult. Um, um, I, I will say like, um, it's more like being in touch with what is going on in, in reality. It's like being, being involved with, with people doing stuff. It's, it's very time consuming and sometimes we don't have time to to see films, I will, I will say, well, filmmakers that are important, but say, Tarkovsky or, <laughs> or our Mexican um, uh, film directors are really interesting things uh, that we like. Uh, um, for example, Regadas or, or I will say, say, Iñari to, um, in some moments, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, but no, it's not like we are uh, very well versed on, on films. Or it might be difficult for us to watch films uh, because, I, I, and I guess it's because, th I guess this happens when, uh, for instance, when you do, you have a trade, uh, something very specific that you do, then when you see other works like that, it's like you see the work, but you're also seeing in between lines. So sometimes, and, and this might be more personal, I don't know if you guys uh, feel the same, but uh, when you see a film, you know you're seeing not just the film, but like the, uh, the filmmaker's approach towards that issue that uh, he or she are talking about. Uh, so that's, that makes it more difficult because uh, sometimes it's like you don't agree with the approach the filmmaker has taken with the film, so it's like, oh, you're watching it, you can't stand it. It's like, no, I can't continue. Uh, yeah, I will say Lionel Rettel, which is a, a Dutch yeah. filmmaker, which, their films are very inspiring in, in terms of how close he can be with the, with the themes and the people who are uh, portrayed in, in their films. No, he follows for years uh, this family and he has this trilogy of films where in Indonesia, no? uh, yeah, in Indonesia, and he so you see the the family like uh, uh, struggling with with life, daily life uh, stuff, and and you see kids that are growing, and but it's so close, like you don't, it's uh, it's always questioning how how can how what's the how's the way we, he can be able to be so close? It's a uh, it's always a question that we. We are thinking of how, how to create, as Omar was saying, like circumstances to create this closeness, even if it's an interview, which could be very, very common on, on documentaries, like especially for television. No? You do interviews, of how can you create uh, an ambience of, of, of trust and comfort? And so it's, I will say that that's a, a good reference.
to bring it to a close, let's take two questions, one here in the room and another one from people online. Go ahead. <coughs> well, I, <did. laughs> uh, I have a reflection question, uh, probably no right answer. Well, I'm also thinking about Tijuanaados Anonymous and one of the, and, and by the way, I still don't know if that's a satire or if that's like people were being genuine, genuine with their anxieties. Uh, one of the lines was, it's a city with, with little identity. So I was wondering if you could reflect on or just give us an insight, maybe speaking for Tijuanaese people, how do they feel about history or their history or the history of their city, for example, compared to Mexico City, where you walk there and you turn one corner and there's Art Deco building that reminds you of the 1930s architectural renaissance. You turn left, there's a Diego Rivera mural. You get on a subway stop that's named after Cortez. You see reminder of the Aztec empire, et cetera, et cetera. But um, what is the contrast that experience for like being from Tijuana? Well, it, that's a uh, that's something that Tijuana has is like this. It's always changing. Um, if you go now, well, you've been there lately, but from a, a period you go and then, then there's new buildings and the old ones are, are gone. Pretty much what we know it's happening here in LA as well. No, it's uh, uh, it's this type of, of of cities that change a lot. Uh, Tijuana is very dramatic in that sense, and and sometimes the the identity is this no identity. You know, it's very it's very difficult to to define uh, as an uh, identity, uh, like something that you can uh, root on and to say this is the identity of the city. I I will say uh, one important part is this um, this. Um, Characteristic that it's always changing, um, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's difficult to say that that line is, um, is true uh, today. No, because uh, I think it's um, depending on who you ask. No, uh, in my case, like my, my experience in the city, is still I see this lack of identity because it's always there's. Uh, there is an effort to to copy from from the outside. It's, it's not necessarily like something authentic from from it. It's it's something that it's very common not to, to copy. And so you see, very particular in architecture, it's, it's always like copying. The, there's a there's a, um, a tree building uh, project uh, in Playa de Tijuana, uh, and they were able to to build two buildings uh, first, and those are with this architecture from the late 2000s. Uh, and then they stopped constructing because they didn't have the money. And now they are constructing again. And the third one, which is supposed to be like linked to the other two, it's, it's built with a totally different architecture because it's, it's more trend, like trying to mimic the trends of architecture no? today. So you see that and, and you see, well, I, I think it will be better to, to keep the, the, the original idea, no, uh, it was a design and also, but but you see that and eventually that will become some like a pastiche or something that the city has, but it's it's not good or bad, it's something that the city has, no, it's, it's quality. Great, thank you. Well, why don't we close it with a more technical question from uh, Natalia Reyes, who's online watching it. She mentions that she just watched your Love and Rockets, uh, documentary based on the comic book by the Hernandez brothers. And she states that uh, this made her wonder about the different strategies and techniques that different subjects require. How do you work around limitations in the documentary form, whether it is the subject like comics or the availability of documentary footage available for more historical based documentaries? It's a good, good question, and thank you, Natalia, uh, for asking it. Um, I mean, there's no like formula to make the documentary films because each each issue is different, so each one has different challenges, and you have to work around and see how how to do it. So I don't know. It's like I guess it it, it 
in our case, it evolves from uh, that approach, you know, that knowing that we're going to coll collaborate. And uh, for, so, for instance, with the Hernandez brothers, uh, it was challenging for us to connect with them because they're so busy. They're always doing things and, and giving interviews and all that. So, uh, but we managed to create the space for us to sit down and, and, uh, and talk face to face and just feel each other. And it was important for us to, to take into account, well, yeah, because one thing is whatever it is we want to say about them, but uh, we were very much wanted to know what they wanted to say, right? And and then once that was uh, uh, that moment happened, then it was okay. How are we going to build this the story and make sure you know that that it's uh, a piece that that we're all part of it and we're all in, involved, no? Um, so. I don't know, I guess things also, as Paola was saying, we're always talking about things and throwing ideas uh, and not so uh, to mention like one example in this particular film uh, about Love and Rockets, I remember that uh, I guess it just happened. It, it feels like, oh, an idea came up and it just felt right, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I remember at first, it's very easy for you if you're going to do something about comic books, uh, and you see this in a lot of films about comic books where you see the artwork on display, but it's like animated. And so the drawings are moving, no? And it might be more visual attractive, or maybe people do it to bring in an audience that is not used to comic books, right? Uh, but our feeling uh, was no, yet let's not do that it was the easiest thing to do, right? Scan the comics and, and just put them in the computer and, and create these visuals, right? And we said, no, uh, we feel best if, it, if we honor the craft of the Hernandez brothers and they work on paper and they still up till today, after 40 years, they work on physical paper with pen in hand. So we said, we need to honor that. And one way of honoring that, uh, is uh, the, the, the object that they do. So let's film the actual comic books. Uh, that involved like figuring out with uh, uh, Eric Waldron, our director of photography, how to have a crane there and put the camera to see the, the comic books. But we wanted to see the pages, you know, bent and, and, and the ink, you know, which is not like, uh, 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 like, uh, uh, and and uh, and we did that in just yeah, in <laughs> yeah we, we use um, micro diopters to really get close to the paper and and also technically like to move a camera at that uh, level of, of closeness is very difficult any any touch of the camera is some movement no, that you can perceive so technically it was also uh, the level in in a sense look the movements and all that were trying to mimic that that craft that they have known so it, it was like honoring the craft by doing something also with a craft no which is the cinematography to do that to be able to to move the camera pan the camera inside a paper no? inside a piece of paper that is not low out or something no it's the same size that they use so it was like a regular size kind of where the where the camera was moving around so yeah, any each project has its own uh, requirements, and we ended up like trying to be truthful to the subject and and trying to reflect that in in the way we edit and the way we approach the rhythm and and even music and all those decisions, no, that you have to have to take.